Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus today for episode 5 of 5, the final episode on fire. Fire is really, really cool. If you don't agree with us on this by now, I don't know why you watch this show, because we just spent four days talking about what fire is and why it's here on Earth and how it became a possibility. Fighting fire, cooking with fire, burning yourself with fire. Hopefully you don't do that last one too much. We're also going to talk today about unnatural fire. Fire that maybe you've never thought about. So now we know what fire is and we know how to fight it, but there are other fires that are just crazy, like space fire. Fire here on Earth, you can picture, you understand, right? We have gravity, we have air movement, we've got air pressure in the same way all over the world. It makes sense. But in space, like a lot of things, fire acts completely differently than fire here on Earth. It's been portrayed in movies as kind of flowing over surfaces and things. None of that is correct, which is really interesting. Up in space, there's microgravity. There are, you know, people floating around. It's not zero G, it's microgravity, right? They're essentially in free fall. Scientists and engineers wanted to study how fire behaved in microgravity, and everything that NASA builds is pretty fire retardant. They don't want fires to start. So this experiment was pretty cool and fairly risky for NASA, but they wanted to understand how fire might move in space so they could better put it out if it did occur. We've learned that fire comes from combustible gases, of course, that rise up and they ignite. In microgravity, they don't work that way. Think of a candle flame. It's like a tear shape, right? Because the flame is going up. It's heated. In space, it's a little different because it doesn't have to compete with gravity. The air isn't coming down below it to move back up and going down again. It's not feeling that same air pressure from the Earth itself. The neat thing is when something burns in space, it becomes a flame ball, a little sphere of flame. It looks kind of like a Christmas ornament in the pictures. It's got a little red center with a blue outer sphere. The neat thing is that when it burns, it's called a cool flame. Cool flames here on the ground, here on Earth, they would extinguish right away. But in space, they can burn for at least a minute which is not good because cool flames are impossible to see due to their low temperature. We humans just can't perceive them. Cool flames burn at around 600 degrees Celsius. A candle flame, which is kind of the smallest flame you probably would come around, that burns at 1400 degrees Celsius. So essentially you have invisible fire in space. What could be more terrifying than that? It doesn't even have flames. It just kind of burns coolly as a little floating ball. Invisible space fire might actually be good news, though, because they think they can use this discovery to help improve car engines here on Earth by burning fuel more cleanly, more efficiently, and increasing gas mileage. They also think that knowing this could help them detect fires in space and make sure that they're completely extinguished, because they wouldn't have known otherwise to look for something so cool. Not like cool, like whoa, cool, like temperature. There's never been a fire on the International Space Station, but there has been on the Russian Mir Station back in 1997. It was successfully put out with no injuries or deaths. Way to go. Back on Earth, you can have invisible fire, but it doesn't work in the same way as space fire. Another kind of crazy fire is something called methanol fire. Methanol is a liquid chemical. It's CH3OH. It's colorless, it's volatile, which means it can vaporize, it's flammable, and it's poisonous. And it's used for a bunch of different things, from organic synthesis, solvents, and antifreeze, to fuel. And it's not really invisible, like really. Flame color, of course, depends on the heated element, right? We were talking about this earlier. Heat excites electrons in elements, and it moves them around and changes their color. So pure methanol is about 37, 38% carbon by weight, whereas ethanol, and that's 52% carbon by weight. So it's got more carbon, so it burns differently. More carbon equals a bigger punch, a more exothermic, more heat-based reaction. Less carbon equals less of a reaction. Flames are not as hot, thus they're less visible. They don't burn with the same color. And in this case, methanol burns with a clear blue color, just like that space flame. And it's difficult to see during the day. Now this is important to know and understand because in 1964, at the Indianapolis 500, there was this 
large seven car crash. Two drivers died in this crash. What happened is, once they crashed, their gasoline-fueled cars exploded. That thick smoke completely blocked the view of the track. Not just so the rescue crews couldn't get in to save the people who were in the cars, but also cars that were driving around the track couldn't see either, causing more problems. After that crash, they mandated in racing cars that they use methanol, because when it burns during the day, you can see through it. So if there is a crash and there is a fire, you don't have to worry about the smoke blocking it. That was until late 2006. Methanol has a lower risk of flammability in general compared to gasoline, produces just one-eighth of the heat, and is easily extinguishable with water on top of the burning invisibly thing, which is great for this. Fun fact, it's so invisible that in 2014, the U.S. Chemical Safety Board released a bulletin saying, methanol is dangerous <laughs> because there were several accidents in classrooms of teachers and students burned during demonstrations because they couldn't see the methanol fire. They didn't know it was there. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. It's, you know, invisible fire. It's kind of cool and kind of weird at the same time. So we've talked about invisible space fire. We've talked about invisible earth fire. But there's also this other kind of fire. It is totally visible, but you can't see it because it's underground. There are right now thousands of underground fires burning on every continent except Antarctica. They are underground coal fires, and it's a huge problem because they are not only burning up resources like coal, and thus producing the greenhouse gases that doing that burning would do anyway. But one underground fire in India has destroyed over 41 million tons of coal. I mean, that's worth billions of dollars, and it's been burning since 1916. It also destroyed 250 homes because it burned underground, eventually under the houses, swallowing them. Plus, of course, as I said, it spews toxic pollutants into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, methane, mercury, and a whole bunch of other things that could have been refined out prior to it being burned. These underground fires aren't anything new, and they aren't necessarily something that humans solely caused. Evidence is that they've been around since the Pleistocene era, which was 1.8 million years ago. There has been an underground fire burning in Australia for 5,500 years. Ancient people used to use the heat from that underground fire vents on the mountain where it's burning, they used to use that heat to cook their food. Smart. Some of these underground fires are human caused, but some were lit by lightning or spontaneous combustion. Coal mining is a problem in this case. You have the fuel, which is the coal, the oxygen, and then you just need heat, right? And that heat can be provided by tools, by machines, by sparks, by you know, any number of things. The most famous underground fire in the United States is in Pennsylvania, in coal territory, in Centralia, and it was thought to have started from people burning trash inside of a closed coal mine. The fire started in 1962, and it's been burning ever since. The town of Centralia, Pennsylvania, abandoned. Doesn't have a zip code anymore, and as of 2014, has a population of 10. As the coal burns, it turns to ash and collapses the ground around it, which brings in more oxygen, allows the fire to burn more, and allows it to sustain itself. These underground fires are extremely difficult to put out. Some of them are miles long, they're 90 feet below the surface, and they can be 100 feet thick of just fire. Sometimes they will pump cryogenic liquid to try and put them out. Sometimes they'll dig fire breaks, like when we talked about forest fires. And they can also maybe even squirt foam in there to try and expand and put them out. But it's all very expensive, and it turns out that it sometimes is just easier to let them burn. And if ignored, that's exactly what they'll do. They'll smolder and slowly work their way through their fuel. There's one in India that I talked about earlier. It said that it's got enough fuel in that coal mine to burn for almost 4,000 years, another 3,800. There's the door to hell in Turkmenistan, one of the most famous underground fires. What happened is the Soviets wanted to mine this oil field. Turned out it wasn't oil, it was natural gas. And they thought, oh, well, we'll just burn off the natural gas. It'll be fine, right? And that was in 1971. The natural gas field that they started burning collapsed it's the size of a football field and became a massive burning crater. Still there, still burning. People visit it. it gets like 50,000 tourists a year, according to Wikipedia. So, you know, check the source there. But either way, it outlasted the USSR. Sick burn. Fire is hot, but when you look into the flames, you know, not only 
now when you have listened to this show, you're gonna know what that flame is. You're gonna know what it's made of. You're also gonna know how they were made, how we harness them, what we can use them for, how we can fight them. You'll even know why they're the color they are, right? That's why we love doing this show so much, and we hope you do too. So make sure you subscribe to Test Tube Plus. Let us know down in the comments what your favorite thing is about fire, and if you have any suggestions for future episodes. You can come find us on Twitter. We are at Test Tube. I, myself, am at Trace Dominguez. Thanks a lot for listening, for watching. We'll see you next time on Test Tube Plus.